Welcome to the Scottish Parliament. My name is Anne Packard, and I'm closely involved with a charity called the RSA. And I would like to welcome you to the 2022 Festival of Politics. This year's event celebrates the festival's 18th year of provoking, inspiring, and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. We're delighted you can join us today to participate in the 21st Century Migration and Asylum Policies Panel, and I will later invite you to ask questions and make comment. But please keep the questions short. Um, if you're keen to throw your thoughts out into the ether, you can do so using the hashtag, hashtag FOP2022. And I'm very pleased today to be joined by Dr. Xavier Zaisai, Dr. Sarah Kiambi, and Dr. Dan Fisher. You can find out more about the panelists on the Scottish Parliament website and indeed that friendly thing called Google. Dr. Zazai has been Chief Executive of the Scottish Refugee Council since 2017 and was previously Chief Executive of Coventry Refugee and Migrant Centre. Dr. Sarah Kiambi, who I had the pleasure of chairing on a Zoom event some months ago, is Director of Migration Policy Scotland, which is a new independent think tank promoting a constructive approach to migration. And that project was launched in October 2021. Dr. Dan Fisher, on my right, your left, is a geographer with an interest in borders, asylum law, and refugee integration. He's currently working on a project titled Scotland's New Scot Strategy, towards an international exemplar of best practice in refugee integration. Um, I'm going to start by asking our panelists some questions. And I hope that both those questions and their answers will give you food for thought for your own questions a bit later on. The first one is how well or smoothly is the migration process working in 2022? And that might relate both to the UK and Scotland, of course. And how important is it to challenge the often polarised rhetoric we hear when discussing migrants and asylum seekers? Now, who would like to start on that one? <laughs> you, yes, you. OK, Sarah. Thank you. thank you so much, Sabir. Um, and thank you uh, so much uh, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I wanted to start on that question because it gets to the heart of why we set up Migration Policy Scotland. Um, as Anne said, it's set up to promote a constructive approach to migration. And there were, one of the reasons why we thought that was so deeply needed was because of the increasing polarisation of our politics, which meant that the ground to discuss more substantively the options to the dilemmas that migration poses was getting very close to non-existent. It was just questions of should it be more or less? Are you pro or against? Um, and that actually, you know, this is an incredibly complicated global phenomenon with local impacts, um, with options and things that we need to be thinking through. Um, and it's a process that, with the ending of free movement following the UK's departure from the EU, is going through an absolutely, mm -hmm. it's a once in a generation change, the ending of free movement. It is the most significant change most of us are likely to see in terms of our labour migration system in, a, in, in the course of our lifetimes. Um, most of our, our um, labour migrants have come through um, the EU, um, particularly post-accession in 2004. Um, and so we, we are now in the middle of, a, of a, a really big shift, and we're in the middle of a really big shift at a time where it's really difficult to know what's going on. To some degree, COVID has massively disrupted our, our data sources, so we're a little bit more in the dark than we used to be. Um, we are also in the middle of a scheduled change to how migration data is gathered. So we have statistics that we're not quite sure how we compare them with what's going on before. 
So it's really difficult to answer how well is that system working in. What we know is that it's done a huge pivot. We haven't seen a change to net migration post-Brexit. The number is still roughly around 230,000. Um, but what we have seen is a, a almost unprecedented switch in the numbers where, where those people are coming from. Um, and where there used to be quite a lot coming from the EU, they're now almost exclusively coming from outside um, the EU. Um, what that means in practice is something I think we still need to think through. Um, because I think, for instance, in Scotland, the, the increase in migration that we've seen in Scotland over the last 20 years has mainly been through accession. Um, and we've, we've gotten quite good at that. We've gotten good at accession migrants. But now we probably need to get good at something else, and we're not quite sure what that is yet. Um, so I think there are some real concerns there um, about how well it's working, how well it will meet labour shortages, um, how, what the options are for using any of that to address population concerns. But the answer is that we still don't know, and we're still not getting to a point where we can have a sensible conversation about that. And that's something that we're re really looking to change at NPS. Dan. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think on the whole, we'll agree a lot on this panel on things. Um, I think I'll yeah talk briefly on the matter of rhetoric. And I think this is, as someone who spends some time dipping in and out of Twitter, rhetoric is a scary word and scary thing right now. Um, but I think if there is one benefit of Brexit, which I don't know if there is, but one benefit might be that we are all becoming slightly more familiar with the complexity of borders and how hard it is to navigate both borders physically and also the bureaucracy, the amount of bureaucratic hurdles that people encounter when migrating. And this is something that in the era of free movement, I think we've all managed to escape somewhat. Uh, and yet, as someone who's, okay, brief aside, my wife just got sent some of her old belongings from Italy and uh, basically our customs tried to charge her for this and all of a sudden you're just like, oh, she's from Italy, sorry. And all of a sudden we're just encountering all these uh, small hurdles that we've never encountered before. And my hope, <laughs> maybe I'm quite naive, but my hope is that by encountering all these hurdles now, uh, the general public will start to understand the complexities of borders more and as a result hopefully our rhetoric around migration might become uh, slightly less black and white. Although pattern and volume perhaps have changed since, since the period you were in England, would you like to come in on that with your experience, yeah. both of Coventry and Scotland? Yeah, um, I think if you, if you were asking for a, for a, a very short answer, <laughs> whether the system is working swiftly, I think the answer is no. I think what we need to look at is that we haven't done over the last 20 to 25 years is two things. We've not tried to understand the scale of the issue. And secondly, we've not tried to understand why people are moving in the first place. So the scale, friends, if we just pause for a moment now, there are 100 million people forced to flee their homes around the world. That is the scale. Majority of these are women and children and families. There are 100,000 people stuck in the UK's asylum system. Not that these people arrived yesterday altogether. These, some of these people are waiting for years. You heard the broken asylum system. It's not broken by the people arriving. It's the ineffective, inefficient system that we have. So, so it's the incompetence that has led to 100,000 people who have hopes and aspirations, just like me and many others, to give to this country, to have a dignified life, a roof above their head and be part of our society, are kept out. There are 30,000 people kept in temporary detention type accommodation. There are 10,000 people who put their lives on the line to serve British interests, who were evacuated after spending nights on the tarmac in Kabul, who arrived here. They're still in hotels 
10,000 people, they arrived with rights, they've got status, they can work. They worked for us in Helmand. They can work for us in Edinburgh. They can work for us in London. Those people have the language skills, they have all clearances done, but they're kept in hotels. So I think if you look at the scale and understand the scale, then we will know what the system is, what the system could look like. But before we try to think about the system, I think we need to think about this fundamental question of why are people moving? People are moving because of inequalities. Inequalities in the right to be safe and be protected. Inequalities in the right to have access to health. Inequalities in the right to be able to wake up in the morning and take your children to school. Inequalities is at the heart of why people move. And unless we understand that, no system will work or help us to address the global migration and refugee crisis. I'll leave that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to move to the second question, but please don't forget to store in your mind anything which is said to ask your own questions in due course. Um, according to the UNHCR, over 5 million refugees from Ukraine have entered Poland, Romania and Hungary, with the United Kingdom taking in less per capita than most other European countries. Should more be done, and clearly you've made that point, to ensure that refugees are, and this is not my word, it's a word given to me, distributed evenly throughout Europe. I think, it, which I would like it to have read, should more be done to ensure that refugees are welcomed evenly throughout Europe. Um, Sarah. Let's start. Oh, so you don't yeah, want to take on that? Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. I've, uh, I've, <laughs> but I, I think um, we need to see what the UK did. And I think we did something that no other states around the world has done. We know the images on our TV screens reminded us from Ukraine, reminded us how life can change for people overnight. Those images also reminded us of the upswelling of public generosity, the goodwill of each and every one of you trying to reach out to help Ukrainians. What the UK did was introduce a visa scheme for refugees. Refugees don't need visas. Refugees need protection. So currently, if you look at the Ukraine scheme, there's Homes for Ukraine scheme, there is a Ukraine family scheme, there was a super sponsor scheme, there was a Ukraine extension scheme, there was God knows whatever other scheme. And if you look at the Afghan protection, there is the Afghan Refugee Citizens Protection, ACRS, and then there's an Arab program, and then there's another one just introduced recently. Refugees don't need schemes, they need protection. The UK had that moment to show leadership like any other countries like Europe, which lifted its temporary legislation to protect people. Ireland didn't say we need a visa for people to arrive here. So again, what we've done in response to Ukraine in terms of the public response, the upswelling of public generosity, and the work that all our civil servants, the governments and others have done is remarkable. There's a lot of really good effort gone into it. The problem is the way we responded to Ukraine. We asked refugees to apply for a visa, fill in 90 pages long application forms when Putin's bombs were dropping. The problem is there. We could have done a lot more there. Not everyone from Ukraine will come here. Not everyone from Afghanistan fled. When I became displaced with my family in the 1990s, not all of us wanted to go to another country. We counted days, months, weeks and years in a refugee camp to return back and rebuild our home. Many of the Ukrainians that I meet here, on Tuesday I was on the ship in Leet and I spoke to some families. People want to go back to rebuild their lives. But we need to treat them with dignity and respect. We need to give them a chance. If they want to rebuild their life here, we need to invest in that. If they want to go back, we need to give them a dignified return. Sadly, the response that the UK gave was out of the Beyond Refugee Convention because Ukraine happened at a time when the UK was working on punitive nationality and borders bill. 
which criminalizes people like me who arrived in the back of a lorry here 23 years ago. So there was no way the UK government could have said all Ukrainian refugees are welcome because that would have then said we need to scrap the bill. So, thanks. Sarah, do you want to uh, yeah, add? I'll, I'll add something. Um, it's important to recognise that we're answering this question in the context of Scotland having recently paused its uh, process of accepting more Ukrainian refugees. And um, basically a large part of the reason for this is to, to be frank, the mess that our reception has been of UK refugees, and I don't exactly like to point fingers, but the UK government has a lot to answer for, and Sabir has eloquently spoken about the, uh, the visa scheme. The, so, and that caused an immense number of blockages pre-arrival of Ukrainian refugees. What we then had was that in Scotland, the UK government decided to bypass local authorities who have been in charge of the Syrian resettlement scheme in the past and instead went straight to households asking if they could support. And I'm by no means attributing any blame to households. I'm incredibly thankful for anyone that's supporting Ukrainian refugees. But the issue is that local authorities had no say or control over how this process would happen. And as a result, this is now a scheme which is facing immense problems as we're trying to solve, like they were trying to solve it in the short term without knowing whether or not this is going to be a medium or a long-term problem. And as a result, funds have been used in certain ways which might not have been. And uh, I think I'll say one more thing, which is the harder you make it for someone to arrive through visa schemes, the less likely it is that they will then decide to try to um, go back to, for example, Ukraine if they are uncertain of what will happen next time or what will happen next. So then, as a result, you are forcing people to live in a place where they might not want to be precisely because they fear not being able to come back if something happens. Um, I'll just feed in very briefly. Um, so in terms of migration as a field, we tend to distinguish between protection migration and non-protection migration. So um, protection migration are the refugee and asylum issues that, that Sabir focuses on. Um, our work at NPS is on non-protection migration, so people who come to work, to study, to join their families. Um, and one of the reasons we distinguish, and that, that distinction obviously isn't quite that clear cut, people's reasons are often very mixed, um, but one of the reasons we distinguish is because that, that, that puts you into a different logic. One is, is give, allowing people to come somewhere because they need safety and that is the right thing to do. The other is about, well, people move and states control access to their territory and states might have different things that they try to do in relation to that. They might want to build up certain sectors of their industry, they might have population concerns they're addressing, they might recognise that people should be able to live with their spouses um, and their family. Um, and, but those are two slightly different sets of considerations. And I think what, what Sabir highlighted is a bit how, given the amount of pressure we have on this at the moment, um, in political terms and in other terms, we are seeing a kind of a, a running together of these two things in really unhelpful ways, like requiring people who need protection migration to apply for visas, which is really a labour migration thing. Um, but it's also going back to this point about the symbolic, and I think Dan mentioned, you know, the, the issue with, with a lot of this remaining rhetorical is that while we have had some good responses in rhetoric, what is happening in practice is really deficient. And that's where, and it's not on, my, on, on protection migration that I want to do that, but I, I really think there needs to be more done to turn that rhetoric into practical reality and to have those conversations rather than to have the political signalling conversations that we tend to have about these issues. And those conversations are very complex, actually. How do you, um, uh, you know, provide entry for hundreds of thousands of people? How do you accommodate them? How do you integrate them into your society? How do you give them the right menu of options? Those are conversations we should be having, but instead we're involved in a sort of either we're being tough or we're signaling that we're being really generous. Um, and I, I just think we really need to make more space for that practical work and that, that 
that really constructive dialogue to happen on, on the practical options about how we turn so what are sometimes good intentions into reality. But returning back to your question also is to think about, and, and I don't know because this is not my field, it does seem that there is a huge amount of pressure on the Refugee Convention and on the systems for how we, you know, how states accommodate um, people who are fleeing and that those systems need to adapt. But there seems very little prospect for coming to good solutions on that, given our current geopolitics. Um, but I think that's something that both Sabir and Dan have much more um, to add on than I do. And I think we'll have questions we'll, where we can we'll reflect get on that. the future in a minute. Um, Dan, would you like to lead on this one? What do you believe is the best practice when it comes to focusing on the integration of migrants and refugees versus ensuring that people are able to maintain their own identity? And specifically, is a multicultural or assimilationist approach more effective? Uh, yeah. Sorry, just making notes. Uh, so, I'll just briefly explain uh, the, the kind of two approaches that you've mentioned. Uh, assimilationist uh, is fairly simple. It means people arrive and they will uh, adopt our norms and values and uh, assimilate. Uh, multicultural uh, has kind of had a bad rep, uh, which I think is slightly unfair, but in principle kind of means that people are able to maintain their own uh, cultural norms uh, within a kind of host society and uh, I would add a third to that which isn't on the question but there's intracultural uh, where the idea is that basically instead of multicultural where two kind of sit alongside intercultural accepts that there is going to be change on both sides and uh, in brief that's kind of where the answer lies uh, which is where if we try to have a political uh, system in which integration is understood as either you assimilate or you don't, then we're just heading towards problems because it's unrealistic and uh, frankly fairly inhumane to assume that people will completely assimilate our norms and values. It's also unrealistic to assume that people will live alongside each other and not change. Uh, instead, uh, what Part of my project that I'm working on is trying to help define how people and communities change when they move to a new place and how we can encourage this change to be a productive change. So that's, a, a fa I hope, a fairly short I'm answer. I'm going to go along the road, Sarah. Um, so I think this always ends up becoming this sort of the, the battle of, of terminology. You know, you have these different bits of jargon trying to describe different approaches. Is it this? Is it that? Um, and I think what, what Dan has said is very helpful is that, of course, what actually happens is in practice is a little bit of both. Um, but having said that, I think one of the things that troubles me with integration policy is that it, it seems to me that whenever we come up with a new phase of integration policy, it's, it's a policy that seems actually much better suited to the migration that we had about 10, 20 years ago. So for instance, multiculturalism was a policy where you had large, that to me, in, in its inception, was linked to a time when migrants came in much larger blocks from certain countries. So you kind of had blocks and this idea that you know, there'd be different blocks and they'd have their, their things and you, know, you would recognize that in law or at least in policy somehow. Um, and then we got, you know, and, and right now for political reasons, I, maybe we would say we're in an assimilationist term. So there's also, there's a lot of signaling going on here. Um, even though I think, you know, that the EU kind of phrasing that, you know, integration is a two-way process seems to me like really just, yes, of course it is. Um, you know, people change and how they change and what they might change and what differs depending on something, some of what they bring with them, but also the context they're in and where they're trying to go. And what, what really troubles me with some of this at the moment is that the one thing that we do see in migration data now for the UK, and I think this will probably hold fast for a lot of Europe, is that migration to the UK is diversifying rapidly. We don't, it's no longer from, you know, former empire or from increasingly from EU. It's actually we're seeing more and more people coming from more and more countries, and they're going to more and more different places. 
And in Scotland, I think that's really important as well, because they're also going to places where migrants didn't go to before. They're going to rural areas. They're going where the jobs are. And I think we need to adapt how we think of integration and what we want from it in relation to what's actually going on. And we consistently fail to do that because we have these arguments that are really about either about our conceptions of the past, which are often nostalgically wrong with their sense of coherence, or our conceptions of the future, which are also maybe mistakenly optimistic, where everybody lives in cosmopolitan harmony. Um, and, and actually, you know, we're not having the, the more honest, practical conversations about, OK, so if all of these people are going to live together and it's going to work really well, how do we do that? What are the good things we could get out of that? And what are the, the things, the challenges that we're going to have to try and find ways of tackling together? And who talks about that with each other? And who decides? Um, and that, to me, is completely missing at the moment. Role for civil society rather than the politicians, maybe. Dan, and then I'll go to... Yeah, I just w wanted to really quickly jump in on... Uh, you were talking about two-way process of integration. And what I found really interesting recently is that there's two definitions of two-way integration. <laughs> there's always multiple <laughs> definitions of everything. Uh, but um, so I, I'll just big up Scotland for a second. Um, so for the most part, when you read two-way process of integration um, in policy documents, what it means is uh, people will, uh, migrants will arrive and then they will, to a certain extent, adopt norms and values. Uh, and then the two-way part often, actually, often means that uh, the host society will help them do this. And that's not how I understand two-way integration, and that's also not how Scotland, through its new Scott strategy, understands two-way integration. It, Scotland currently understands two-way integration being that the host society will also adapt uh, to people arriving. So I just wanted, and in terms of kind of difficult conversations that need to happen and kind of uh, adjusting our rhetoric, I think that's, it's, it is really important to kind of uh, be aware of these multiple meanings that people have when they use certain words. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to add. Okay, yeah, I think for me, integration happens when both sides, the arriving community and the state, fully discharge their responsibilities. Sadly, with recent examples, the burden of integration is very much on the person arriving. So the state, in terms of rights, a rights-based approach doesn't happen. So if we take the example of, let's say, the Afghans in hotels and the Ukrainians on the ship, Integration does not begin in the back of a hotel room. It begins within our communities, in our post offices, in our bus stops, in our neighborhoods. So if you put people away and then expect them to speak and sound like us, and that doesn't work. And even within the UK policy of asylum as well, accommodation centers, putting people away, locking them away or keeping them away, I know we've got a housing crisis, we've got other issues, we've got cost of living and so on. If we expect people to sound and behave like us, then we need to invest in them and give them a chance and opportunity as well. And I look back on my own example, because for me, integration wasn't a, an ESOL course or somebody teaching me how to integrate. It was the society accepting me and giving me a chance. I arrived from Afghanistan, from a mono-faith, monocultural society. The only culture I knew was the Afghan culture. The only religion I knew about was Islam. And in 2017, when I was leaving Coventry, I was member of Coventry Cathedral Council, advising the Bishop of Coventry on interfaith matters. So how do we make that kind of transition happen for everyone? So I think integration becomes problematic when the burden is on the person but the state is trying to be regressive in its approach to welcoming people. So again, it goes to that question of inequalities and injustices. So I don't know, I'll leave it to you whether I've integrated or not, but in terms of my rights, I don't think I've integrated. So in 2019, when I was privileged to receive a honorary doctorate from University of Glasgow, the only person I could think of was my dad to be at that ceremony with me. And when I invited him over, 
the Home Office refused him. So I'm not fully counted because I'm not trusted in a way. So has integration happened for me? Well, I think in terms of how I speak, maybe it has. Has integration happened for me in terms of my, all my rights, even my children's rights as well? No, it hasn't because they are deprived of seeing their granddad on a special day. So, thanks. But was that a photograph of you with him? In he arrived two days before the That's right, the but there was that marvellous yeah, photograph in the get, newspaper. Yeah, we managed to get him over. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, before we go on any further, is this a lecture we're getting, or are we supposed to be having a debate? I would like to support that statement. The pattern of events in the Festival of Politics is determined by the Parliament and has been this format for many years. And it not involves... I was, I was, not the last one I was at, it was a debate where there was a good debate about this. This should be a debate, not a lecture. Exactly. I want to make my opinions known about the asylum and immigration. I didn't come here just to hear the same old story that we hear... All right, you may, you may frame a question when it reaches the question point. Meantime, I will continue in the Parliament's format with thanks to those of you who are keeping your questions as opposed to your opinions, and you can make those elsewhere. Now, this man has walked out. He's unhappy. What have you got to say about that? That anybody... The majority of the audience is unhappy with your interruptions. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. Sorry, it's so staff, could you escort these Spanish people... Anymore. Could you escort these people out if they're going to disrupt, please, Anne? Please do not disrupt the event. I am the f following the format requested of panel chairs by the Scottish Parliament as determined by the Parliament's corporate body. Please bear with that. On to the climate crisis, and I will perhaps roll the three questions together so that you do have your chance to frame succinct questions, not give opinions. The climate crisis is set to increase global displacement. And how in Europe and elsewhere should we prepare for this and measures that might be implemented? Then discussion around the impact that migration has on the host country's economy and is migration a solution for countries with an ageing workforce? And Germany and Spain have been cited. And more importantly, looking to the future, and I'm mindful here also that this parliament has an effective futures forum, what policies would you like to see Europe implement? Um, Sarah. Um, to, to try on, 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 on the three questions? Yes, we'll take okay, I will, I will, I will try and remember them. Um, so I think um, on... Climate crisis, you will remember, uh, and the issue of water was something that Parag Kanna mentioned yes. in the Yeah, but I, 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 will, I will leave that. That's more of a protection question. Yes. So I think, I think in terms of um, economic impacts, what we know from the evidence is that migration has been, on balance, beneficial um, economically and fiscally. Uh, migrants have paid in more in tax and they've taken out in services. Um, we don't have evidence um, for uh, th th that migrants have been displacing um, British workers from jobs. Um, we do have some limited evidence that there might, may have been some uh, uh, wage level uh, pressure, pressure on wages in, in some lower paid sectors. Um, but, so, so on balance, we see that this has, has been generally uh, positive for the UK economy. Um, and I think we're, we're going into, a, a, now with the end of free movement, obviously that, that will be more restrictive and we have more exclusion from, from that lower end um, of uh, migration into, into those kind of sectors where, where there may have been wage uh, pressure um, it, it is no longer possible. Um, but I suppose we are moving from an, from an age of, of free movement, um, that that's being, what we're really seeing is the end of cheap movement, because in a way employers through the new system, it, it's a lot clunkier, it's a lot more burdensome, and it's a lot more costly. Um, so I think 
it is going to be interesting to see how business responds to that, and I think there will be labour shortages. Um, there are options for what to do about some of that, um, but we, we will see the impact of that in economic terms, and I, I expect it to be negative. In terms of population, it's a really, really complicated question. You cited Germany and Spain, but I think you know what we need to remember is that Scotland is actually the forerunner in terms of population aging across, mm -hmm. across uh, Western Europe. Um, we have the fastest aging population. Um, and we have had a population strategy um, since the early 2000s, of which migration should play a role. Um, and it can play the role in, in offsetting aging, because obviously migrants also age. So, so what it can do is it can buy you time. Um, you can't really bring in migration at a scale to combat um, population decline. Uh, population aging because it, the numbers just get too big. So replacement migration isn't really an option. Most ex experts agree on that. The demographers agree on that. But but there is a role for migration to to maintain the viability of areas that are experiencing really rapid population aging and population decline. And I think we we are seeing that in parts of rural Scotland. Um, but it is a really complicated picture because it, you need to address the issues that are making population leave areas, that those factors, you know, whether it's the availability, lack of availability of jobs, um, pressures on housing, those will affect migrants just as much as it affects the people who are leaving those areas. So unless you kind of come up with a more holistic solution, you can't just you kind of chuck migrants at it and hope for the best. That's not how that works, but there is a role for that. Um, uh, and it, it will be an increasingly important role, particularly in sectors like care, like health, we know in the workforce planning that there is a lot of aging out of that workforce, particularly at senior levels, expected over the next five to ten years. And that will have serious impacts on all of us. And it will have impacts that we can't, we can't hope to, to mitigate through training people up, because training people up into those jobs will take longer than the time it's going to take to age them out. So we need to have a solution somewhere. And that solution, that's what I mean, migrants can buy you time in that. Um, and by bringing that in. But it is a complicated solution, um, and it's one that I, I really think we need to start investing the, 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 you know, the capacity to, to think through uh, in, in much more detail so that we can make it happen. Yeah. Uh, Take yeah. any of those, because then I'm going to move towards the public question. Yeah, <laughs> I will talk briefly about questions of employment, and I'll talk from the context of asylum and refugees, because that's what I know. Uh, I'll just uh, throw out some statistics for you for a second. 18% um, of refugees are currently unemployed in the UK. That's two thirds higher than the national average. 32% of uh, people seeking asylum in the UK left school at the age of 20 or higher, compared to 23% of the UK national average. This means that we have a surprising, look, well, it means that we have a very talented um, group of people who are currently uh, un, either unable to work or also underemployed, as in they are accepting jobs far below their, their levels of qualification. And there are lots of structural barriers in their way, um, one of which is a current under provision of ESOL, as in learning English. Uh, another is that in the UK, we are really bad at recognizing uh, non-UK qualifications and certificates. And we have very few means for people to convert non-UK based accreditations that they have. And so when we talk about uh, the role of migrants uh, filling jobs, uh, often people are hoping that they will fill low skill jobs, which they, don't, they shouldn't have to. They, we have plenty of higher skill jobs that need to be filled. And also people are skilled to fill these, but they are unable to at the moment in the UK. And I think this is a really important thing to mention in the context of labor. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're on, a, on a shared journey, no matter where people come from, what skills they bring or not bring. People contribute in one way or another. Um, I use my own example. I arrived with only seven years of formal education. 
And when I arrived in the UK, if you'd asked me to be chief executive of Scottish Refugee Council, I might have run back to Afghanistan. But again, it's believing in what people bring. The least people could bring with them is their dreams and hopes, and I think we need to invest in those. After the Second World War, people from all backgrounds came and helped in rebuilding Europe and the UK. And today, the second generation is our lawyers, accountants, politicians, Home Secretary, and the same will happen with others as well that will arrive today. People want to be safe, people want to have a roof above their head, and people want to have a dignified income. They're just like us, people want to go about their life and make a positive contribution. So I think we need to have a future policy that is based on, it's got a rights-based approach, it's one that is built has got any, whatever that system is, it needs to have compassion at the heart of it. And we also want to make sure that we continue with that approach of solidarity rather than whether these people will address our population crisis or other crises and so on. I think let's see what they will give, not instead of I think, that, I think there needs to be that global solidarity. And COVID was one of the best reminders how much we rely on one another and how much our well-being is dependent on one another. You never know, we might need protection and I think we need to treat people the way we would want to be treated. Sarah, just before I go to the audience, you mentioned earlier the con conventions how realistic is it to hope, and with what degree of speed, and these things are slow, do you think a revisions to existing or totally new conventions could and should be introduced? So I, 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 I'm not able to answer that question. I, I don't work on, on climate migration um, or on protection conventions, so I don't know. I mean, I think these things are very difficult to do. Um, you need agreement, geopolitical agreement. I think my general sense of global geopolitics and who, who's feeling like they might want to step up to the plate on that it makes me feel rather um, not optimistic, is, is how I would put that. Um, so I, 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 think, I think what's really interesting with climate, climate, the potential for climate migration, that people might have to leave places because weather makes it difficult for them to leave there is that it, it might make us all think about what if that climate crisis was here? What if we had to leave here and go somewhere else? What might we want in terms of our reception elsewhere? Um, I, think, I think it does provide an opportunity to, to imagine what that might be like in a way that it, it, it feels often when we talk particularly about asylum and refugees that we, we are talking people about people coming from, from areas of the world that are less stable, um, less wealthy, um, and, and that we don't see that as something that, that might apply to ourselves. And I think it's actually quite useful. I, I think what, what was very interesting about the Refugee Convention is it, it came out of the turmoil of post-war Europe where people were much more used to the idea of this could happen to me and it could happen to the people I love. And what does that mean for how we should, you know, how we should work together? And I, I think, you know, I agree with Sabir on that. I think there is a role for compassion there, and I think, but I think it's in relation to protection. For myself, I do think there is legitimacy in states thinking, this is what we're trying to plan. And how does migration sit into that? And, and how does that mean that we select the migrants in those other parts of our migration system? That's not about protection. And that not all of that can be about equality and global solidarity. Some of that's about, well, we want to grow our tech sector. So that's what we're, you know, that's who we're prioritizing. People who can help us do that. And I think that's, I think that's fine. Um, and I think it's actually necessary. And I think it's good to be organized and constructive in that way. Uh, I'll very quickly add uh, that the very first climate refugee was recognised last year by the UNHCR. So this is something that has now got precedent, um, but that's not been recognised by an, a national agency such as the Home Office. 
uh, but there is international precedent. The thing I would add to this about forward planning, and I agree with you, that my worry in this context of uh, climate migration is that the people that are doing this planning right now are usually thinking in a kind of securitized manner, and they're thinking, what does this mean for security, instead of asking questions like you were saying about what does this mean for employment, mig migration in general, integration, etc. And my one message in this context would be we need to desecuritize a kind of thinking around climate migration. Thanks. I'm going to turn now to questions. But before I do that, I would like to say that I think that reading, and I'm probably as old as some other members of the audience and older than some of younger members, like Omar at the back there. Um, the broadsheets in the United Kingdom have in my lifetime provided astonishing reading, and some of the most astonishing reading has been the contributions of those people who have come to this country, to the United Kingdom, in the most difficult of circumstances. And I think we need to allow those of us who come to our shores now to make their singular contribution. So now, could I look for questions uh, if you would raise your hand, please, and wait for one of the staff to bring you a microphone. Please make it a short question so that other people have a turn to ask a question, if that's possible. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the question of how we do help people to integrate quickly by achieving their own personal aims. Um, I've worked with a number of refugees over the years and found that stuck in the system, um, the people they encounter are very invested in their own system, but often they put up barriers because they don't actually ask the person what they want to achieve and what's the quickest route. And if I may give one quick example, um, a Syrian friend who has years of experience of driving um, has been told, you know, he has to pass the theory test before he can do that. His job coach gave him a commitment two years ago to learn English. At no point did anybody check A, how he was to achieve that, how he was getting on, give him any target as to when he'd achieved sufficient English. And when asked if they could help him to get through the driving test, he was told, no, sorry, we can't do that. A an interpreter who'd worked with other Syrians, got 10 Syrians through the test in nine months by producing his own course um, and offering to help them through it. Now, he can't get funding and he's self-employed, so he can't do that. Why can't we just set up simple systems? And why can't we allow people waiting in a system that often takes years to work while they wait? Other countries can do that. Thank you. Uh, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I'm happy to respond to that. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, there is uh, opportunities currently based on learning from Ukraine where a lot of employers are coming forward to engage with refugees into their work. So it's not a kind of like us going after employers, employers coming forward themselves. So it could be driving instructors, others, and so on. I think there is some hope that based on what we are learning from Ukraine to make life better for others as well to engage with employment sooner. But there are barriers within the system. There are barriers, policy barriers, uh, for example, uh, people seeking asylum uh, are not allowed to work. So we're campaigning on that with others across the UK. Um, so in that period, however long that might be, well, the, the Home Office's target was six months, but there are some people who are in the system for six years or more, um, and we miss out on their skills, we miss out on what they've got to contribute, uh, but also life is difficult for them with £40 a week as well. So. Um, um, we, we do hope that Ukraine will help in improving that system. Um, and I think maybe through our integration policies as well, so in Scotland we've got the new Scots Refugee Integration Strategy. Uh, there is a strong focus on employability, on upskilling, 
Um, and a lot of people from refugee background particularly, but others too, come from a, an entrepreneurial background. I think there is a lot of people who would want to set up their own businesses. Um, no one wants to be a burden on anyone. Everyone wants to have a dignified income and want to be part of the society. And um, um, I was at the at Glasgow airport welcoming Ukrainian families. Uh, and the first word that I remembered from my time of going to school in Afghanistan, we were, we were taught Russian, so I didn't t learn much. But I remember the word robot, which is work. So the first thing I heard was work, and I asked them, I said, are they thinking about, I said, yes, the first question was, can we find job or can we work here in Scotland? And so people come with that potential. They might be leaving behind everything. They might be having terrible experiences, but ultimately they want to, like all of us, want to be able to have a dignified income. Uh, yeah, I'll add to that. Um especially because your question is about language and that is really important and uh, the New Scots integration strategy recognises the importance of language in the context of integration and yet uh, language at the moment is learning language is something that is both misunderstood and underfunded in, in Scotland right now. Um, one of the ways in which it's misunderstood is that there's this belief right now that people will go to language classes, learn enough English to then access a job or pass a test. And anyone that's learned a language, a second language, will know you learn by doing. And so we, by having this mentality uh, that people will first access language classes and then access a job, it's just a very back to front way of thinking. And uh, we are also, undervaluing the role of interpreters in this integration context. And some of the business, some of the refugee run businesses in Edinburgh have been able to be set up because you've had, they've had interpreters uh, and people who decided to give their assistance because they understood the number of hoops that need to be jumped through before you can open a business. Um, I was speaking to someone from COSLA who, uh, COSLA is like the association of local authorities and he was saying that the, the DWP can see how many people access their, gate, their business gateway online service to set up a business. It's all in English with zero support for anyone working in another language. As soon as people encounter this website, the number of people that just leave it straight away is incredible. Um, and so this is where, you know, we, we've all mentioned how complex uh, integration and migration is. Uh, but it's about understanding what you can do about this complexity and one of, the, one of these things is, as I said, to recognise or help people have their uh, accreditation recognised and the other is to not think that language comes before work. It's both together. I'm going to be very brief and just, just echo um, both the panel and yourself in recognising that, that we have these problematic aspects, particularly in relation to asylum and refugee where we keep people outside work in a way that effectively de-skills them and isolates them, but also that when we do do the training, you know, we, we don't do it in ways that are particularly helpful. Um, and that's something that, that really could do with changing so that we can unlock all of that potential. As well as make it easier on people, mm -hmm. you know. Was like a civic challenge. <laughs> right, I have two people here, two men, one older, if I may say that, and one younger. We'll take the older one first. <laughs> right. Um, it, I'm, interest, I'm particularly interested in the asylum system. So, uh, what are the legal criteria for granting asylum? Because I notice politicians are very vague about this. So, um, uh, we'll start. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, so currently, as you arrive, uh, you would claim asylum on arrival, um, and um, the UK does not give an asylum visa. So there's no way of you applying to the UK and then arriving, apart from the Afghan scheme and the Ukrainian schemes that were introduced in a. Um, in, in, in response to, to these crises. Um, there's no other route for people to arrive in the UK. The UK's current system is that you need to arrive on our shores to then 
claim asylum. Um, and that process could take um, quite a long time. And that's what I mentioned. There's about 100,000 people in that system, uh, all waiting to be processed. Uh, some, uh, yeah, uh, there, there are some cases where people might get refused or other people might be asked for additional evidence uh, to, to present. Uh, but the new Nationality and Borders Act that has been introduced will make that even even problematic because what happens is that currently the system is that you need to convince the UK uh, that you are fleeing persecution or human rights violations or a war and then based on that then you either are given refugee status or some form of status or you're refused and then you appeal. The, Nationality and Borders Act that was uh, ratified at the Queen's speech um, more or less stipulates that the focus will move from why you are fleeing to how you are fleeing. So there is um, a provision for inadmissibility in, in this new act. So if you arrive through, uh, so the, the system will be focusing on which route you took to come to the UK. If you arrive through various states, then you are inadmissible. And you could be a woman from Afghanistan fleeing from Helmand, where you lost your husband fighting with British armed forces. No other route for you to flee. You arrive here in the UK, you could be deemed inadmissible. And some of you might have heard about the Rwanda plans as well, that you could be sent to Rwanda, not for your case to be resolved there, but just simply being dumped there to claim asylum in Rwanda. The, and in this... I don't know if just because you asked yeah. about definitions, I mean, the, I can't remember the exact definition off my head, but basically you have to be able to prove that you have a well-founded fear of persecution for being a member of a certain group or of a certain nationality. It gets slightly complicated because you have uh, a grant of refugee status or you have humanitarian protection, which is usually if it, you can prove that it's unsafe for you to return. Uh, so a lot of people uh, from, let's say, Afghanistan or Syria right now, they will receive some form of humanitarian protection because they can't necessarily prove that they themselves are, will be persecuted, but they can prove that their country is an unsafe place to be in. Mm -hmm. So it is slightly complicated, but it's less complicated than we pretend. Do you agree that politicians tend to ignore or, or, or to just obfuscate what is acting? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what's happening right now is that uh, the waters are getting muddied with uh, our Home Secretary mentioning the idea of economic refugees. Like, that is not a definition that exists, mm -hmm. um, but as a result, it complicates matters immensely. They are, they are uh, people seeking asylum, and they should be granted refugee status. Second row. Um, so this is a bit more regarding like government rhetoric, because it obviously can influence public opinion, even if what the actual provisions that they put in place are still inadequate. Um, so, for example, like when the Ukraine war is happening. The, the government point of view seemed to be all Ukrainian welcome, we, we support Ukrainians, however, when the migrants seemed to be coming from Syria and countries like this, it was, the talk was about a, a migration crisis and almost a, as if our, our borders were under siege. Um, so even like, well, the response to Ukraine, as you said, is, in, is inadequate with the, the visa systems, um, that rhetoric can still influence public opinion about how how we how society looks upon uh, migrate, mi migrants. Um, so I, I was wondering what you thought your reasons were for that. Was it just politically convenient, or is it possibly something that's more deep seated in racism, or along those lines? Um, with Syria being, for example, Muslim majority country, whereas Ukraine, mm -hmm. as a country, is majority white. Yeah, I, I think. Again, this, um, uh, we won't jump to conclusions on this, but what it is is that um, when a crisis happens like Ukraine and Afghanistan and Syria, 
uh, people tend to move within the region, they become displaced in the region, and it's a pressure on that region initially. So when the Afghan crisis happened, uh, it was the neighboring countries, and same with Syria as well. Uh, but because Ukraine is so close, it's within that region where then the region thinks that we need to do something. So I think to be fair to European states, UK and others, is Ukraine is close, it's here. We, there, there needs to be that, that response to what we all can do. But again, there is also that potential of differential treatment of people fleeing almost similar situation. And, uh, and I think uh, that creates a, 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 a uh, a sort of like, yeah, there's no homes for Afghans or homes for Syrian scheme and others and so on. Um, so um, the problem is these various schemes. Uh, so if we work, based, if we have an, an asylum system that is working based on the foundations of the Refugee Convention, then that gives us a system that will have a flow. So our call from within the refugee support sector was that Ukraine and Afghanistan clearly reminded us how what these people who are within our asylum system have fled. So that, in a sense, if there is Afghans within that system, if there are Syrians, they're fleeing crisis, they're fleeing war. And if there was some form of an amnesty and a swifter processing of people within the asylum system, which is 100,000 people in the waiting list, that would have given the UK 100,000 supported accommodation units through the asylum system, and then there wouldn't have been need for the government to say, I want all of you to open up your spare rooms to welcome you. We could have added that as well, but that, that would have helped the government. So, so it's that backlog that has created those issues. And again, I think the other uh, point in this is narrative as well. I think narrative does make a difference. Um, sadly, over the last few years, the narrative is very much problematizing the refugee issues, seeing it as a crisis, as a problem, uh, rather than as a form of some form of solidarity for us to help and support these people because they're fleeing dreadful situations. So, um I think that that's been a really good answer to, to your specific question, but I wanted to take the opportunity to just pan out slightly from it and, and just talk about the issue of, of government rhetoric on migration more generally. Um, and I think migration is, is a really curious policy area because it sort of, it sort of has this sort of weird double-faced edge. It's got the, the what, what, in, in liberal democratic states, it's got, it's got the expansionary inclusionary bit, which is about solidarity, um, human rights, you know, universalist principles and, and, and liberal norms. And it's got an exclusionary element, which is a kind of more us and them, and, you know, this is our territory and we're allowed to keep certain people out. Um, and, of course, publics, in terms of their opinions, go right across that spectrum. There are some people who are against immigration, and there are some people who are pro-immigration, and those two elements can be quite fixed, but there is, there is also the vast majority of people are kind of in the middle and some people call those the anxious middle. They don't quite know what to think. And what they think depends on which type of immigration you're talking about and what types of issues. There's some people who worry about jobs. There's other people who worry about cultural issues. There's people who worry about security. Um, and I think government rhetoric is trying to play to different audiences. And it, it's also mixing in these different groups in ways that are often unhelpful. So they'll talk about migration when they mean asylum, they'll talk about X when they mean Y. So, so you have this, this sort of muddle. And, and you also have this very polarized politics in which, in my view, immigration functions as kind of a touchstone or a proxy issue. It's a way of talking about discontents. It may be discontents about change. You know, the world is changing and it's actually very disconcerting. And it's, it, it, you know, seeing, oh, the reason for this change is immigration. That's what's making it all change in ways I don't like. It is a, is a kind of a, a way of grabbing onto an explanation for that. Or we use it as a proxy for talking about race, um, when, to be honest, most migrants actually aren't um, from a, a BME background. Um, so, you know, we could talk that some of them have been racialized, but it's it sort of... So it becomes a proxy issue for things that are difficult, for all kinds of discontents. 
And again, there is the, even in, particularly in the Scottish context, also con discontents about our constitutional settlement. So that what we would do would be very different if we had powers over immigration. Um, is another way of using immigration as a proxy issue. So it's a way of signalling, um, and it's a way of, of trying to, to say, yes, as a government, we are addressing your issues. I think one of the things that, that I found most interesting is that in the, in the launch of the new UK immigration system, in the proposals for that, was the first time that I'd ever seen in 20 years in working in my immigration policy, is that I'd seen a labour migration strategy that no longer used the economy as a rationale for what they were doing. So it wasn't, we're doing this because it's going to generate work, it's going to generate more productivity. It was like, we're doing this because this is what people voted for with Brexit. And that was, in my, in my analysis of that, was, well, we're doing this. We already know that there will be economic damage. Um, we know that. I mean, at least in the short term, where that ends up in the long term, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is, you know, that there is this idea that while well, it will add to productivity and that once firms adjust and so on, we will have changed our economic model in ways that we'll look back upon and say, okay, that was, that was necessary, painful but necessary. But currently, we're saying, well, we're doing this because this is what the British people wanted and it's going to hurt. And it's currently hurting in economic terms. It really is. Um, uh, and, and I think, I don't know, I mean, maybe as that, as that works its way through, maybe we'll start realising that actually there, are, there is a need for migration in a way that we didn't need to recognise previously, or maybe that pain will be absorbed in other ways, I don't know, but I think, I think there is this thing about the symbolic function of how this works, um, and the need to both understand that, but also to try to move the conversation on um, so that we can, we can do more constructive and productive things in this space. Thank you very much. Could I just uh, also, since I don't see a hand, I'm waiting to see another hand, ask how you feel the media deals adequately, inadequately, well or badly with issues around migration and asylum? I think yeah, media has got a, a clear role, but I think, again, we shouldn't get into this territory of uh, giving oxygen to the negatives that are being said. But I think there's lots of positive media as well, and there will be lots of positive from the Ukraine experience, people welcoming other people fleeing war into their houses and their rooms and sharing with them whatever little they have. I do hope there will be lots of really positive stories coming out of that, of friendship, of people sharing, and I think we also all have a role to highlight and celebrate and play those. The problem is that the minute there is a negative article about refugees or about migration, even those of us that might not like that article jump onto it and then use our own platform to share it and give it oxygen. And I think the media has got a role, but I think we also have a role in telling a powerful story of things working well. So before there's, in June, there was the Refugee Festival. A lot of really positive stories of people living side by side or welcoming one another or supporting one. We need to be telling those stories to counter that negative narrative. I don't think we can change the media and say, well, you shouldn't produce these articles. That they will continue to do that. That's their business model. I think the role for all of us is to see where we can tell a positive story to counter that negative story. I think there's lots of positive stories. And, that, and I think in that work, again, from our perspective at Scottish Refugee Council during the festival this year, uh, we had a storytelling project. We also had, a me we had media awards for journalists who had done positive and challenging reporting on, on refugee issues. Um, and uh, I think we also need to allow people with lived experiences to tell the story. Mm -hmm. So instead of a, an academic or someone else who, who's read about migration, then let somebody who's had that journey to write an article. It might not be perfect, but it could tell 
a more profound and powerful story to counter the negative stories. Uh, there's questions over there. Yeah. Yeah. Mohammed, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, just to, uh, to thank the panel, um, and, and I really find your contribution very reflective and insightful, so I just want to make that point that's appreciated from my perspective. Firstly, secondly, um, if, if the panel could cover something on um, othering and silencing and uh, in relation to this topic around migration, um, what I feel is that it's, it's very nuanced. You know, just hearing different perspectives from the panel, is, there's, so, there's, there's so many complex and sometimes intellectualized conversations and um, and it can and, and people can some perhaps be detached if if they no, don't know much about it, right? So my question is like, how can we simpl simplify that, and also how can we call it out in terms of uh, the narrative and the conversation like on on racism, for example, on how the connection between migration and and and, uh, and othering. I think it's impo important to start naming it as well. Uh, that's uh, that's the, the, that's the thing. And, and 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 also the silencing aspect. What I mean by that is uh, is, is that sometimes uh, there's words around lefty lawyers or lefty do-gooders groups that c come in in that space who are perhaps misinformed around these issues. How, how can we make sure that we simplify and, and bring them on board around understanding uh, the complexities uh, on, on this topic? Well, I believe you had your hand up as well. I'm going to take these two together if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, I had a very specific question for Sarah, if I may, because she said that there would be economic consequences of the current uh, migration policies, but you said earlier that the figures of 230,000 migrants were about the same, so I didn't quite understand why there should be any economic issues if the figures are more or less the same. And just a kind of other part of this othering, which I would welcome the panel's comments on, maybe a slightly another untold piece of this, is that the Home Office spend on Ukrainian refugees is going to be taken out of the, OD, or the Overseas Development Assistance budget, and it's now at 25% of that. And that means that this all goes into that other foreign piece instead of being seen as something different. And so and that whole other set of people are now going to suffer because of that as well. Thank you. Right. And I need to apologize, the person who, I, I gather there's somebody who's had a hand up who I didn't see, so my apology for that. These two questions and then the last one. So if you'd like to answer Mohammed's question and this one. So can I, can I answer the very specific one about the, the, the numbers? So, so what, what, what the difference is, why I think there's gonna be economic consequences is, is that I think, and we don't know yet, but I think in terms of the data, what we're, we're seeing is we're, we're seeing a shift from, from EU to non-EU. And I think within that also, we are seeing a change in the composition of that migration. So there's more of it is, so previously non-EU migration tended to be for people coming for family reasons and students. So there'll be less labor migrants. And we know that the new system doesn't let you recruit labor migrants below a particular salary and skills threshold. So that's something that free movement used to provide labor for. And it's particularly industries like hospitality, care, um, farming and food processing, um, where there are now shortages because that's the labor supply that they were relying on. And particularly, I think, in, in things like that are seasonal. Um, in a way, data takes a while to kind of get its way through the system, but what I'm hearing from, from certain places is, for instance, that a lot, lot of farmers this year have, last year they couldn't get the crops out of the ground because they didn't, couldn't get the labor in, in, in those months. So this year they haven't put the crops in the ground. Um, they've shifted bits of food processing, like Scottish salmon, off to Spain. They're telling me they don't think they'll ever bring it back because they just can't get the workers to work in that anymore. Um, so we've lost that, that part of that 
of, of the food processing industry. I'm hearing anecdotally, I think somebody told me that in the independent care sector, particularly up no in northern Scotland, 12 care homes closed because they had staff shortages. Mm. Um, so, I mean, obviously th there's a huge, you know, like, what is it? Is it, is it? is it just the migration? Is it the economy? Is it COVID? Like, it's very hard to like disentangle that empirically in some way. But what we do know is that we used to be able to get people in to work in those types of sectors and in those types of jobs really very easily um, because they could just come over and as long as they had a passport, they could work in those jobs. Whereas now you need to apply to be a sponsor, you need to pay for that. They need to go through, get a visa. Um, you need to keep monitoring, you have to have systems in place. It, it's really much more complicated. So that's why I think we now have a much clunkier system. And while we've got the same number of people, like in terms of net migration, I don't think they're doing the same things anymore. And I think that there are economic consequences for that. Could you answer Mohammed's question? Yes, I think it's important to, uh, to move away from othering people. I think, uh, again, as I said earlier, COVID reminded us we're all one. When we are in crisis, we're all one, and these people are fleeing crisis. And I think we also need to remind the public and everyone that what we're doing now with Ukraine or with Afghanistan or other crises is not something new. We have a history of offering people protection. And, and if we dig deep into our own history, each one of us will have links, will have connections. So it's just giving that message that migration is and will continue to be an important part of our history and offering people protection and sanctuary will be one of the most important values. Thank you. Now, I do apologise. I hadn't seen your hand up. Um... What's the panel's view on the hordes of people crossing the English Channel in rubber dinghies? Now, some days we're getting 700 people across. If the weather was perfect all year round, that would bring us into the region of a hell of a lot of people pouring into the UK. A small country, densely populated. Right. Your question is their opinion of so the So what, what is your opinion and how should we put a stop to this? Because it's completely out of control and everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. to respond? Yes. Yes. Well, first of all, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, it's, I, I, I would disagree a horde of people. I arrived in that channel, and I'm proud of my history of arriving in the back of a lorry in this country. That was the only choice given to me. I was fleeing the Taliban. There was no way of going to the Taliban and saying, Mr. Taliban, I'm fleeing your regime. Give me a passport, and then walk to the British Embassy to stamp it with a visa. That didn't exist. That was the only choice given to me. To cross, to cross the channel. Let me, let me, answer, let me finish my answer and then you can... So, for majority of those people who are crossing the channel, that is the only choice and option given to them. If we had an effective, efficient asylum system, if we had a humanitarian visa system where somebody's life was at risk could apply to the UK, and if we had a, an efficient fair system here, if we had a family reunion scheme where people could be reunited with their families easily, then people will not take those perilous journeys. There was no way for me to come to the UK. And even today, because of what I say here on this stage or anywhere else, if there's a risk to my dad, there's no way for him to come and join me here. He will have to take that journey. That is the only option the UK provides. There's no asylum visa to the UK. There's no family reunion scheme. The family reunion, if I wanted my dad to come over through family reunion, the Home Office will be asking, how many radiators do you have in your house? How warm it is? How... They will find a number of reasons to refuse. They refused him a visitor's visa, so they would do anything to refuse him on a permanent stay. So people have... The, the, the UK's approach to asylum is very much like, don't come here. That's what it is, simply. And the new act is basically saying that if you come here, you will be deemed inadmissible and you'll be dumped somewhere else. 
We've got two minutes to wrap up. So, Sarah and Dan, your response to that question, please, each of you. So, basically, since 1951, the Convention states, if you've got a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, political opinion, um, membership of a particular social group, you're entitled to seek asylum in another country. So that's a right people have, and it's well, a right for states. These people are Albanians. They're not, they're not, they're sorry, not could you I, let I'm the sorry, panel they, they, answer, so, please? So if, you let, if you let me finish. Um, <clears throat> so I think, and because it doesn't suit states to meet their international obligations, one of the ways around that is to make it increasingly difficult for people to arrive on the territory so that they can make claims for asylum. And we've now gotten to the stage where we've closed all the other routes in to such a degree that, that more and more people are turning to rubber dinghies in a way that is incredibly perilous um, to them, to the people who end up rescuing them. Um, and I think what I would do is, is have more routes by which people can seek asylum safely in the UK. Yeah. Dan. I will very quickly counter your uh, suggestion that something like 48% of people uh, arriving in the UK are Albanian. Uh, I will also read out some of the UK Home Office's statistics on uh, the percentage of final asylum grants and other humanitarian protection. So in 2016, 47%, 2018, 45%, 2019, 52% and after that 53%. So people who are arriving in the UK and claiming asylum, on average, half of them are entitled, according to our rules and law, to refugee protection. Okay? This is a really important fact to bear in mind. So, in terms of what we do, if we squeeze really hard and we do our best to keep people out, then we force people into taking very perilous journeys. That does not stop people from making perilous journeys because, as Sabir said, people have a need to make perilous journeys. Another thing that we need to do is we need to face up to why people, as both of my other panelists have said, why people are moving and why they choose to, choose to move to particular countries. Sometimes people rely on people smugglers because we have hard borders, in which case they don't have a choice as to which country they arrive in. Sometimes people move because they already speak a language. Sometimes people move because they already have family or friends in a particular country. The reasons why people choose to move to a particular country are really complex. And saying, oh, you've passed through a safe country like France or like Turkey doesn't help in this situation because there are so many reasons why people don't just want to move, but they have to move to a particular place. I think your statistics emphasize the fragility and volatility of the world and the need for all of us to consider that people should be able to move by safe means in safety to a degree of security and an optimistic future. Um, thank you all for your contributions. Before we close, I think I've given you your minute. I'm going to get my, into trouble with the administration if I run over. So we must end, but I would like to thank you all very much for coming today and for contributing in all different ways, but most especially to Dr. Sabia Zazai, Dr. Sarah Kianvi, and Dr. Dan Fisher for your insights, and to remind you that there are other festival events taking place today and tomorrow, including Are the Strong Men of Politics Killing Democracy? Cost of Living Crisis, elect her on female political representation at all levels of society, and of course the in conversation with the writer and poet Len Sisse on Saturday, to name but a few. So if you haven't already got tickets for those events, do consider getting them now. And I hope you have enjoyed this Festival of Politics. I think it's one of the most marvellous things the Parliament does, and I would encourage you to be back here next year if you're not back here tomorrow.